Okay, the question is that Amendment 11374.1 in the name of Stephen Kerr, which seeks to uh, amend Motion 11374 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary uh, Bureau setting out a business programme be agreed, and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. And the result of the vote on Amendment 11374.1 in the name of Stephen Kerr is yes, 52, no, 64. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The question is that Motion 11374 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau uh, setting up a business programme be agreed. Are we all agreed? That is uh, agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 11375 on approval of an SSI. I ask George Adam, to, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move the motion. Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. And I call on Russell Finlay uh, to speak up to three minutes. Mr Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. A range of temporary powers were enacted by the Scottish Government in April 2020 at the start of the pandemic. Some of these were indeed temporary. However, last year, the Government extended the use of others. These included the expansion of fiscal fines. The Crown Office issues fiscal fines as an alternative to prosecution. Prior to the pandemic, the maximum was £300. The, the emergency COVID law increased this to £500. The Government is today asking members to maintain the £500 limit until this time next year. The Government submitted a policy note to the Criminal Justice Committee. They stated that increasing the maximum fines allowed prosecutors to use them, and I quote, in a wider range of cases. Those five words, a wider range of cases, are the key issue. I asked the Justice Secretary exactly what new crimes are being dealt with by way of fiscal find, fines she either would not or could not answer. The Cabinet Secretary tried to deflect that there was ideological opposition to fiscal fines, which is not true. I'm sure that crime victims have no ideological opposition. I'm sure that they would expect to be told when they are being issued. I'm also sure that the public expect to know when fiscal fines are issued for serious crimes, including acts of violence. People want justice to be done efficiently and effectively, but they also want transparency. So to recap, in 2020, the Government passed an emergency law to widen the use of fiscal fines. They did not tell the public what new crimes they would be used for. They relied on the support of all parties, including mine. But if this SSA I is agreed by members today, this significant and supposedly temporary measure will be in place for almost five years. Do I have time for an intervention? Br briefly, uh, Mr. Okay. Briefly, Pauline McNeill. Thank you. Uh, would the member agree that, in addition to what has been said, that several times uh, Labour has challenged whether or not the Crown does need more than up to 260 days to prepare a case for indictment. And if we pass this tonight, without any, no justification, uh, this will be extended again to 25, 25, 26. 
Russell Finney. Yeah, I think that's another good reason to vote against this SSI. And I note that Labour at committee voted uh, alongside us uh, in opposition to it. Now, this is a shabby and lazy way to legislate. If the government wants to widen the use of diversion from prosecution, they should be honest and upfront about it. They should, they should pass new legislation that would explain exactly how fiscal fines would be used. They should not resort to doing so by stealth, using COVID as an excuse. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Finlay. Uh, and I now call on Angela Constance to respond. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, again, up to three minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. I attended the Criminal Justice Committee on Wednesday, the 8th of November, and explained the approach taken by the Scottish Government in respect of this statutory instrument. In particular, I noted the Coronavirus Recovery and Reform Scotland Act 2022 includes a range of temporary justice measures that are due to expire at the end of this month. The measures were originally introduced as a direct response to the pandemic, MSPs will be aware of the adverse impact the pandemic had across many different areas and the justice system was no different. Whilst recovery is well underway, it is not yet complete. The need for some of the measures originally introduced has reduced. That is why I was able to advise the committee that certain measures have been expired. Presiding officer, I know MSPs have rightly shown a keen interest, for example, in the extended time limits. And I was pleased to advise committee that more than half of the extended time limits put in place at the outset of the pandemic, four out of seven, eh, are being expired. And I also confirm to committee that I have no plans eh, to make temporary time limits eh, permanent. I do not want any extended time limits for any longer than is necessary if they are not needed. And this statutory instrument is an indication of the progress being made in court recovery. More generally, the Scottish Government has considered carefully the operation of the provisions and engaged with justice agencies and stakeholders. The findings of the Scottish Government review are set out in the Statement of Reasons, uh, laid alongside the statutory instrument. Uh, there are three main reasons for maintaining some of the temporary measures. One of these is the clear support from justice agencies for some of the temporary measures to be made more permanent. Uh, that is why um, earlier this month I published a public consultation that proposes making permanent certain temporary measures which will help improve the justice system and make it more resilient, efficient and effective. This includes proposals to make permanent a national jurisdiction for callings from custody, increasing the maximum amount of the fiscal fines and the virtual attendance at court. And, President Officer, I hope uh, that I indeed clarified at committee uh, that the uh, increase in the range of fines covers the same range of offences. Uh, and I had endeavoured to explain to Mr Finlay the difference between the number of cases uh, and indeed the, the range of offences. Yes, of course. If I, if I, do I have time, President Officer? I can give you a little bit of time back. Yeah. Mr Finlay. Uh, I, I have to disagree with the Cabinet Secretary's assertion. The statement from the Government to the Committee was that this would be for a wider range of cases. That is quite clear. So could the Cabinet Secretary now explain what cases these will be? Cabinet Secretary. So, President Officer, uh, as I have uh, confirmed to Mr Finlay, uh, not once uh, but now uh, twice, uh, that the increased fine rate applies to the same offences and perhaps in terms of his issues about cases, um, it, the fiscal fines uh, by uh, having increased uh, 300 to 500 pound range, that now covers cases where the Crown Office consider a 300 pound fine insufficient in the circumstances but where they do consider uh, a, a 500 pound fine um, appropriate. Presiding officer, keeping these elements in place pending consideration of permanent legislation is a sensible approach to take and the consultation provides an opportunity to seek wider views uh, on these proposals. Another reason, presiding officer, is the court system is still in recovery uh, from the pan pandemic. Um, and given that you're pressing me for time, presiding officer, um, I'll just uh, refer members to the statement that I made at committee. 
Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 11375 on approval of an SSI. And I ask uh, George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motion. Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and moved. Thank you. And I now call on Douglas Lumsden. Um, up to three minutes, Mr Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. At committee, I raised concerns with the SSI um, and those concerns remain, and I would like to raise them again uh, today. Let me make it clear from the outset, I remain a big fan of heat networks, and I'm convinced heat networks will have a huge part to play in decarbonising our buildings, especially in our more densely populated cities, where having heat pumps in tenement blocks, for example, will not be viable. But I also speak as a formal council leader, where I have experience of their installation, so I know how difficult and expensive they are to roll out. In the partial business and regulatory impact assessment, it does set out a cost of up to $6.2 billion to reach this target by 2035. But it also states that this cost excludes any adaptations that may be required within existing buildings. So the final costs will be much higher than the $6.2 billion price tag quoted. When the Minister at Committee was questioned about this figure, he stated that the Government will only be committing $300 million towards this figure. So we're left unclear where the remaining sums will come from and how achievable, achievable that will be. The impact assessment also sets out the role of our local authorities will play. But I remain concerned that our local authorities being underfunded and council tax being frozen, they will not be able to fulfill the function we require them to take. Especially given that the costs for adaptation of existing buildings are not captured by the assessment, and many of these costs Will be, many of these buildings will be owned by our local authorities. I also note from the policy note accompanying this SSI that the local authorities' local heat and energy strategies will play into the national target, but not all local authorities have completed these. So it does seem strange to set this target without that information. We also have no details on where the seven terabyte, <laughs> terabyte uh, watt hours in the policy comes from. And I worry that the target set out today, like so many of this devolved government's targets, is aspirational, but without more detail, is simply unachievable. This SNP Green government needs to understand that setting targets is one thing, but it is delivery that counts. More details are urgently required. Thank you, Presiders. Thank you, Mr Lumsden. And just for um, clarity, we are referring here to motion 11376, um, not 375. And with that, Minister, uh, I'd call on you to respond for up to three minutes. Minister. Uh, I'm grateful, Presiding Officer, for the chance to respond uh, on points raised on this SSI. It's an order which supports our ambition to grow the number and the scale of heat networks in Scotland. These are systems that will supply many of us with clean heating in the years ahead. The Heat Networks Act requires us uh, to set a target for 2035. But setting this target is not just a legal requirement, it's helpful in and of itself. It will send a very clear signal to the heat network sector that this government, and indeed future governments, uh, are and will remain committed to its growth. And the proposed target of seven terawatt hours is evidence-based, developed using data on potential heat network zones. The proposed target is one terawatt hour greater than the 2030 target that's already set in the existing legislation for which this Parliament voted unanimously. I was pleased to see the committee approve the SSI, but there were some concerns raised, uh, concerns which I have to say I answered repeatedly in the committee, though not to the satisfaction of all members. Perhaps uh, they decided that it wouldn't be to their satisfaction no matter what I said. But let me run through them uh, again. The need for a credible plan to meet these targets is precisely why we published our Heat Networks Delivery Plan back in 2022, setting out a range of actions that we're taking to support the sector. We're under a duty to review how this plan is supporting our targets by March next year. We know that we need to move to create more demand for heat networks, and the upcoming Heat and Buildings Consultation will make proposals on this. There was also concern about the potential cost of meeting these targets. This cost will be, I'm going to make some progress, this cost will be achieved through a mix of public and private investment. This point should be well understood by anyone uh, who's looked carefully at this, no thank you, at this subject. The private investment will be driven by creating demand 
for heat networks. And the funding that we've currently allocated to heat networks is to 2026, whereas the target is for nine years later. We know that there is significant interest from private investors in developing these schemes. And we've already seen good examples of collaboration, like in Midlothian, where the public and private sector are working together. So to compare overall cost projections to public budgets is misleading. Based on our best estimate, heat networks in 2022 supplied 1.35 terawatt hours of heat. So we've committed to keeping this and any future targets under review as further evidence emerges, for example, as heat network zones are designated. But setting this target is just one part of our plan to help grow the sector. We're already taking a range of other concerted actions to allow heat network, uh, the heat network sector to flourish. We're resourcing local authorities to develop local heat and energy efficiency strategies, which are identifying opportunities across Scotland. No, Minister thank you uh, for heat networks. For example, Glasgow's LHEs identifies that heat networks there have the potential to supply between one and four terawatt hours of the city's heat annually. And we've uh, launched the Heat Network Support Unit, which is already helping local authorities through the pre-capital stages Thank of you, heat Minister. network you need to development. Collectively, presiding officer, these actions will help us to achieve our proposed target. And I ask Parliament to support this SSI. Thank you, Minister. The question again on this will be put at, the, uh, at decision time. Um, and the next item of business is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions. I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, uh, to move the motions. Minister. Thank you, President Officer, and all moved. Uh, pardon, uh, apologies. I'll need to tell you what the motions are first. Um, the motions are 11377 uh, on approval of an SSI, 11378 on designation of a lead committee, and 11379 on committee, committee meeting times. And I invite the Minister to move the three motions. I was just so eager to be helpful, President Officer. Uh, moved. Thank you. The question on these motions will be put at uh, decision time, to which we now turn. And there are six questions to be put as a result of today's uh, business. Can I remind members that if amendment in the name of Paul McLennan is agreed to, the amendment in the name of Graham uh, Simpson will fall. The first uh, question is that amendment uh, 11351.2 in the name of Paul McLennan, uh, which seeks to amend uh, motion 11351 in the name of Mark Griffin on Scotland's housing emergency be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be um, a vote. And members should cast their votes now. I should still be on the And the vote is closed. And the result of the vote on amendment number uh, 11351 Point two in the name of Paul McLennan is yes 63, no 51. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 11351 in the name of Mark Griffin as amended on Scotland's housing emergency be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Daniel Johnson. I have to connect. I voted no. I didn't, Mr Johnson, I didn't hear you. Point of order, Daniel Johnson. So my app didn't connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I'll make sure that is recorded. Point of order, Alexander Stewart. I don't think my app worked. It says on the thing that there's no vote voted. So I don't think it actually recorded, presiding officer. I would have voted. I would have voted no. You have not voted, see? The result of the vote on motion 11351 in the name of Mark Griffin as amended is yes 65, no 50. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 11375 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a vote and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is closed. The result of the vote on motion 11375 in the name of George Adam is yes 64, no 49. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 11376 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament's not agreed. There will be a vote and members should cast their votes now. And the vote is now closed. Point of order, Neil Bibby, remotely. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Bibby. I'll make sure that is recorded. And the result of the vote on motion 11376 in the name of George Adam is yes, 87, no, 3. There were 25 abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And I propose to ask a single question on three parliamentary bureau motions. Does any member object? 
The question is therefore that uh, motions double one three seven seven on approval of NSSI, double one three seven eight on designation of a lead committee, and double one three seven nine on committee meeting times be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed, and that concludes decision time. We will move on to members' business. Therefore, I would ask members leaving the chamber to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible.